good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. You're obsessed with her, and you're obsessed with her daughter! All right, easy, Geraldo. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking Club Silencio. We're talking neo-noir doubles. And we're talking about Naomi Watts furiously masturbating on the couch. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace, and you just wouldn't believe what that kangaroo did to this courtyard. <laughs> we're talking... Oh, Coco. Oh my god, I, I thought you were going like, to give, give me shit for picking that line, but I just, like, I, there's so many funny things in this movie that I was like, the kangaroo one is, the, <laughs> to me, the funniest thing that happens in this movie. <laughs> it definitely feels like it could have its old Hollywood spinoff, for sure. 100%. Everyone, we are discussing David Lynch's, um, I'm going to say classic film, even though it's only 20 years old. Uh, celebrating 20 years in just a couple of weeks, Trace. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mulholland Drive, not Mulholland Falls. It's not the same movie. And not uh, Arlington Road, not. also not no. the same thing. <laughs> oh my god, I saw you tweet that and I was just like, oh, sweet baby child. No, nowhere near Arlington Road. Well, because I think Arlington Road was like the late 90s. Mulholland Falls was also the late 90s, but then this was 2001. And my child brain was like, oh, they're all streets. So... <laughs> <laughs> really are you also thinking of sunset boulevard because that's at least a closer approximation to this film yeah well i mean thematically narratively sure i guess but i've never seen sunset boulevard mm -hmm. what about jurassic park is it like down the street from all of these other films that you're referencing <laughs> jurassic road <laughs> oh man joe okay mulholland drive Mulholland Drive, everybody. Oh my god, I am so excited. If only because I didn't really expect that we would get a chance to cover this, because as my husband said when I watched this, is that a horror film? <laughs> to which I slapped him and shoved him in a closet. I, so the, the the funny thing about this movie, I'm sorry, the funny, the um interesting, one interesting thing of many about this movie, um, it is a lot of different things, and it's a million different things. <laughs> I I would argue that any Lynch film you could put in the horror genre, or at least the Absolutely. genre umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's just a couple of scenes, like there's a horrific moments in literally everything David Lynch has done. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I know that we we'll talk about the the man behind the the wing. Keys, mm -hmm. the dumpster, the dumpster. Man, but, yeah. I'm sorry, the dumpster. I don't even know if, who plays this creature, but this person, this creature, this thing. I remember seeing this for the first time. Did not know that this was a thing that was in this movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. Scared the living shit out of me. Oh yeah, I mean, it scares a character to death in this movie. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? No one knows anything about this movie. I fully believe that that character would have come back had this movie actually gone to series. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the fascination about the first two hours of this film, right? Everything could have turned into a multi-season arc had this gone to series. We just don't know. Yes, and, and we'll go into to this more as we go through the production. But yeah, that's why you have like Robert Forster in one scene. That's why mm -hmm. you have Dan Hedaya in one scene. <laughs> it's why you've got Penny from Showgirls. Oh! Penny from Showgirls, Trace. Rena Riffle. She has a name, Joe. Yeah, Penny from Showgirls. <laughs> But okay, sorry. So uh, before we get too far into this, though, everyone, we should point out we are actually recording this um, on July 1st. We're recording this way in advance because this episode is dropping. Well, Joe and I, well, I will for sure be and maybe Joe will be in the midst of Fantastic Fest. Although actually, mm -hmm. you'll be recovering from TIFF as well. Mm hmm. So we were like, okay, cool. Let, let's pick something like further down the line that we can record something easy. And we picked <laughs> <laughs> Mulholland Drive. <laughs> yeah, because we were like, oh, we could just bat this one out. This two and a half hour movie that has a billion different readings mm -hmm. and has a mm -hmm. lengthy production history. Oh, yeah, this will be a walk in the park. Jurassic totally park. fine. But so if, if there have been any national crises that have happened um, between July 1st and today and we don't mention them, um, mm -hmm. that is why. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah or that like really funny recurring joke about the donkey uh you're just not gonna hear it in this episode <laughs> um okay so 
Mulholland Drive, or do we want to maybe pull back a bit and, d- and David Lynch, like our relationship with David Lynch, Joe? Absolutely. Tell me everything about you and David, Trace. My story will be much shorter than yours, I imagine. Okay. <laughs> I didn't experience him. So basically, this was the second movie of his that I had seen. Um, okay. I saw it was, you know, I was in college. I was in film school. I was like, oh, David Lynch is like this prolific director. Right? I need to like see him and like, because mm-hmm. I'm a cinephile. And blah, oh, yes. blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. I'd never seen Twin Peaks. Oh, actually, no. You know what it was? Um, mm-hmm. In one of my classes, it was narrative in television. They made ah. us watch the pilot of Twin Peaks. Yes, it is a classic. It is a classic. If I could paint you a picture of the 300, like, film students watching the pilot of Twin Peaks, A, Mm -hmm. you could immediately tell the ones who had seen it before and were familiar with Peaks and Lynch in general. Right. And then the ones that weren't. And I was definitely one of the ones that wasn't because I was like, what the fuck is this? What is this? But, but I was intrigued, right? Like, you know, the whole thing with Twin Peaks is, you know, a hook, who killed Laura Palmer, even though that's not the that whole thing. That is not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hook. The hook of Twin Peaks is who killed Laura Palmer, but the, it's not important. Like, as many people know, Lynch had no desire in ever answering that question, despite mm-hmm. the fact that the show was a cultural phenomenon. And after seven episodes, people were like, who the fuck killed Laura Palmer? And Lynch is like, well, I have all these other things that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Don't you want to see bodies buried in full size chess pieces? Because that's where season two is going, folks. Come on. Exactly. Although, it's so a full confession. I have seen the entire first season and half of the second season of Twin Peaks. I have been told so many times, I know it's bad, like, just power through it, because it gets good towards the end, and then I can watch Twin Peaks The Return and Firewalk with me, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) I have not done that yet. So um, there you go. Well, I can't say that I'm surprised, if only because you and Lynch do not seem like a good fit to me. And I'm going to say yes, tentatively, but... Only because my only exposure to Lynch, so I've seen, you know, the first season and a half of Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. I watched Blue Velvet in college shortly after because, like, that was the one that I kept hearing was like, oh, this is like, you know, Lynch personified or whatever the fuck. Right, right. I didn't really love Blue Velvet. Okay. And I think I need to give it a revisit because, I, yes. I, I mean, I've, on, I've only seen it the one time. I was probably 20 years old and I was just mm-hmm. like, yeah, what? It's another one of those ones that definitely plays better on a rewatch. Yeah. And then I watched this. Um, and I okay. loved this. Even even when I was 20, I loved it then, and I love it now. Mm-hmm. I think my husband my husband has made me watch either Lost Highway or Wild at Heart. I think he made me watch Lost Highway, but I don't remember okay. any of it. <laughs> mm. And that's that's it. That's all I've seen of Lynch. I haven't seen uh, Inland Empire, even though my husband insists that I need to watch it at some point. I've never Oof. seen Dune. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm surprised that I like this. I'm sorry, that I love this movie so much. Because, yeah, as you said, I, Lynch and me don't typically mix well. And I've had the ability to watch a lot of his other work. But it's one of those things where I'm like, I need to be in the mood for David mm-hmm. Lynch. Oh my God, you and your fucking moods. I, I, I know, but I've, just, I've never been like, oh, yeah, let's put on Wild at Heart. Let's put on Lost Highway. Like, I just, I never... I've never felt like the need to do that because I'm like, oh, I have to like really be in that kind of headspace. Whereas, you know, I watched Mulholland Drive twice in 24 hours this week. (laughs) Yeah. Especially as somebody who's been like dabbling in THC and cannabis, I really Mm -hmm. feel it's like, dude, smoke and watch a David Lynch movie. (laughs) Come on. God. And you know, I actually didn't watch this movie either time stoned, but you know, that actually isn't a bad idea. But I would argue, and I say this not having seen again the majority of David Lynch's work, this is one of his most accessible films, which is probably saying that is right. That is correct. Yeah. So So let's see. So you shut up for a little bit and I'll tell you about my relationship to David Lynch. (laughs) Okay, let's go. <laughs> okay, so I watched a racer head in college. And mm-hmm. then, let's see, by that point, I had probably watched the entirety of the first season of Twin Peaks. And then I had a friend. So the guy that I went to see all the Saw movies with, he mm-hmm. is a huge David Lynch fan. So he ended up doing a big marathon where we watched the entirety or as much as we could get through of Twin Peaks. So we watched <laughs> the entire first season, the entire second season. And then, you know, the sun came up because at that point it's like 26 hours of TV. Right. I've seen Fire Walk With Me. I've seen... 
Oh boy. Yeah. Inland Empire, Blue Velvet. I haven't seen Wild at Heart. That's the one that I feel like I should always watch because it comes up a lot as Mm -hmm. not just his most accessible ones, but also some of his more successful ones. Right. Um, yeah. And then, you know, Dune is like the weird outlier because of course it's not really a David Lynch film. Right. Although it is. I know a lot of people were like, (laughs) but because literally the thing about David Lynch is that everything he does is david lynch even the more commercial properties even the more accessible properties there's something about him that he has never he has never abandoned who he is as a creative artist and it's one of the reasons why even though i don't naturally gravitate to him as like i want a good time film i'm gonna throw on some david lynch right he's the kind of person where i feel like he is a true auteur like the oh. close, one of the closest things that American cinema has in terms of like being true to himself and being weird and uh, it sounds super shitty, but like also not really selling out. Mm-hmm. Even watching Twin Peaks, The Return, everybody thought that it was going to be soften David Lynch in his old age, you know, <laughs> a little bit more like the straight story. And it's like, no, he is still fucking weird. He is still uninterested in linear storytelling. He does not want to give you answers. And if you ask him, he will shut it down and redirect you to coffee and pie. I yeah, I followed the discourse of Twin Peaks, The Return. And it was so funny seeing people absolutely hate it, seeing people absolutely love it. Oh, I love it. I know. I, 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 I'm sure. <laughs> I, I really want to watch Fire Walk With Me because I've seen so many people talk about how much they fucking hate Fire Walk With Me. And I'm like, what is it about this movie that people hate so much? Like, I feel like I need to know, but I have mm-hmm. to finish that second season. Actually. You don't, actually. <laughs> at this point, I think I need to rewatch. Like, I need to start Twin Peaks over. And I was like, oh, that just seems such a daunting task. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the good thing about Fire Walk With Me is really, I mean, you will obviously get more out of it the more you watch of Mm -hmm. Twin Peaks, but you could also watch probably that first season and then just jump straight into Fire Walk With Me. Yeah, okay. But it is a weird experience. Anyway, so that is David Lynch. (laughs) We have so much to talk about. I'm like, okay, we should probably get to specifically Mulholland Drive. (laughs) Well, when did you first see Mulholland Drive? And what do you think of this movie? So I definitely saw this in theaters, although I can't remember why I would have, because this would have been my second year of university, like right at the start, because it came out in early October. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing it because I had heard really positive press, and I was interested in Hollywood set films, because I found that they were often really unsuccessful because they're so inside baseball like yeah. people who live outside of la and aren't familiar with movie making are often like thanks for the movie about going up your own butt <laughs> i'm checking out so i was excited for this because i did know david lynch and i went to see it and i found it super fucking captivating it doesn't mm-hmm. hurt that it has a lead performer in a literal star making turn i keep saying literally like yeah. nothing about david lynch is literal but in this case naomi watts <laughs> a fucking revelation i had heard so much about her performance and i really do think that it's earned and when you go back and watch it you're like yeah it's still earned (laughs) no it's fantastic i mean like she worked before this but it's so interesting um i have the criterion blue of this and she she has interviews i think it would have been around 2014 2015 so there's new interviews with lynch with watts with herring with uh thoreau Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because she's like yeah like i was in a really bad place because it would be like i would get a part and be like oh maybe this will set me off maybe this will start my career nothing happened six months Mm -hmm. go by okay i'm about to leave oop i get something and i was literally like about to just fly back to australia and be like Mm -hmm. whatever it's not working here and my friend nicole kidman i'm like okay (laughs) (laughs) yep still friends you can still see instagram pictures of them well but it's funny right because i will buy two i'm sorry 1999 i guess when they filmed the the pilot for this it's Mm -hmm. like i mean nicole kidman at least a decade already of like you know being a superstar yeah yeah (laughs) but yeah she was and then i got mohol and drive and Mm -hmm. and her life changed well and it's even like okay what if this had gone to series and what it had become either a like it didn't do well in the ratings and got canceled Mm -hmm. or it like attached nami watts to this like seven season series right like her career would be totally different totally different (laughs) yeah Yeah, no, I actually think when I watch this, you can see a lot of interesting threads and picture what could have been. But ultimately, I'm super happy that this is a film because I Mm -hmm. think it plays like an almost perfect two and a half hour experience. It does. And I don't think it's boring. No. (laughs) At all. (laughs) It's weird. It's nonsensical. It's filled with all sorts of extraneous details. And it is captivating for like two hours and 21 minutes. 
and listeners, I feel like we're going to have a di- like two different bases here, right? I mean, obviously, we have people who have seen this movie, and we have people who have not seen this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have not seen this movie, I'm sorry, if this was your first time watching this movie. Right. We will not be giving you answers either. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we, we talked about this off air before we started recording. And really, a big part of any Lynch film, but specifically this one, since we're talking about it, it's not about the answers. Like, there is fun to be had in trying to piece the puzzle together. But at the end of the day, for me, I enjoy the last act of the film, the extra $5 million reshoots that mm-hmm. they did to wrap everything up. I think it's good in terms of giving some kind of resolution to the story. Mm-hmm. But it's not the piece I'm most interested in. Like, for me, the film is fascinating in the little details and the what ifs and the weird character choices and like, this movie has a whole scene where Justin Thoreau just gets covered in pink paint. <laughs> sure. I'm here for it. Why not? There, there's so many things in this where you're like, well, why is this in here? Mm-hmm. And where would it would have gone? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about also the dream theory, you know, the because like, the, that, that, that is the most subscribed to interpretation of this film, which I, mm-hmm. I, I probably do subscribe, uh, subscribe to that, too. I think but- so. Again, we're going to try to maybe hopefully come up with our own readings of this film because that, at the end of the day, is what Lynch wants. This movie mm-hmm. is a puzzle. And one of the the quotes that I saw, it was like, you know, okay, so like the film itself is a mystery. Like, you know, Naomi Watts is your detective of sorts. Yep. But what this film does and what a lot of Lynch does is he makes the viewer the detective. But you're not mm-hmm. trying to solve what's happening in the story. You're just trying to solve the narrative itself like not what the narrative contains but just rather its structure and what this is Mm -hmm. yeah which i love i love it (sighs) so yeah uh whatever infinity loop mobius strip whatever you want to call it like if you have a theory about this and you're saying is this right um yes the answer is yes yes. rank off motion yes (laughs) is this right or is this right or is this right Yes. Yes. <laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a film with endless readings. Welcome yeah. to Mulholland Drive. So, okay, let's go into this production. So we've already said, yes, this started life as a television series. So um, Mulholland Drive began as a 90-minute pilot produced for Touchstone Television and intended for ABC. Um, Lynch sold the idea to ABC executives based on... Only on the on the story of Rita emerging from the car accident with her purse containing one hundred twenty five thousand dollars in cash and the blue key, and Betty trying to help her figure out who she is. Mm-hmm. When Lynch was asked by an ABC exec, <laughs> "What happens next?" he goes, <laughs> "Give me the money and I'll show you." Yeah, he's like, B- "Buy the pitch and I'll totally do it. Uh, I'll t- I'll tell you." And also, if you believe that I will tell you in any kind of <laughs> make sense fashion, you are a fucking idiot. But exactly. they still bought it. Well, and the, the, the origins of this story, I think, started even during Twin Peaks. Sherilyn Pham was in an interview in 2014 even saying, oh, yeah, like, originally this movie was going to be, like, a spinoff for her Twin Peaks character, Audrey. And mm. I can see how that would be can like, oh, it. they were, you know, off shooting Twin Peaks one day and he mentioned that. But then, like, Twin Peaks ended and he's doing his own thing, blah, blah, blah. It's not a Twin Peaks related thing. Not really. No. Apart from the fact that it's the only other television that he's done. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the the story in the pilot includes surreal elements, much like Twin Peaks. Um, They lay groundwork for story arcs like the mystery of Rita's identity, Betty's career, Adam Kesher's film project, you know, I mean, which kind of in the film version gets resolved, but obviously in the pilot would not have that resolution because otherwise there'd be no show. So they film the pilot in Los Angeles for about six weeks. This is February of 1999. They make it a two-hour pilot, so it's a full two hours, which I was really confused by because I was like, well, where are the commercial breaks? And I wonder if maybe they were going to, like, do one of those special broadcasts where it's, like, presented completely Mm ad-free. Yeah, we're going to do ten minutes of ads at the beginning and the end, and the rest goes ahead straight forward. And I do think that Lynch is kind of disillusioned with television because he there's a quote from him too where he's like they care especially during twin peaks they care more about the ads than they do about the show oh yeah (laughs) i mean that's why he was forced to give some kind of closure to twin peaks because they were like oh the ratings aren't good so Mm -hmm. we need you to goose this up and he's like i don't care about ratings i care about the story i'm telling but isn't that a weird thing so i mean i I, sorry not that specifically i get that but that he has this disillusionment with television Mm -hmm. but not with film because studios keep letting him make these weird fucking movies that don't make money (laughs) 
<laughs> Correct. But I think the difference is, is that people now trust Lynch as a name brand. So when you pay him, you know what you're getting. And there's something to be said about, okay, this is a film. It will end after a couple of hours, as opposed to something like TV, where you're really saying, let's start a multi-year relationship, which... Honestly, looking back on Mulholland Drive, I'm so surprised that ABC even said, yeah, make the pilot because, I mean, clearly they thought they were going to get Twin Peaks Part 2. And Mm -hmm. in a way they do, but they clearly didn't want it. Well, maybe we could talk about Hollywood sexism too, because here's the thing. So he shows ABC the pilot. Supposedly, the executive that was going to watch it, he was like, oh, I want to watch it before I go into work. And Lynch is like, what the fuck? It's a two hour pilot, like a full two hours. Mm-hmm. So he, this guy watched it at 6 a.m. on the treadmill, on the phone, like <laughs> standing up and basically told Lynch, oh, it's really boring. We hate it. And they decided not to place it on the schedule. But like even outside of just the general like it's boring. They didn't like the nonlinear storyline, which I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> Who are you working with? Yep. They okay. thought Laura Herring and Naomi Watts were too old. Um, yeah, because if if we are thinking about 1999 to 2000, this is peak popularity for Warner Brothers, right? So mm-hmm. this is admittedly too not middle age, but like late Late 20 something (laughs) early 30s actresses who are competing with the likes of sarah michelle geller and jennifer love hewitt and nev campbell so yeah they look older valid point they didn't like the cigarette smoking by ann miller's coco or justin thoreau's adam they were like oh if you have smoking you have to have them say oh i'm trying to quit or oh i hate these things they're so bad for you (laughs) (laughs) and they also really hated the close frame shot of the dog shit Okay. They apparently were like, you can't put that in there. And Lynchman and Alamo was like, bring one per. I don't care how fucking old they are. If they're one years old or they're a hundred years old, bring one person in here that has not seen dog shit and I will remove this goddamn shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then when he did the movie, he was like, we're going to zoom in on this fucker. <laughs> oh, I love how petty he gets when he talks about going back to do more of this. He's like, I'm just going to make those fuckers eat everything. Mm-hmm. So... It's kind of in limbo. They're like, what the fuck are we going to do? And he, Lynch has a friend from the French production company Studio Canal and he's like, ooh, I like this. Let me see what I can do. Mm -hmm. A year goes by. So this movie, this pilot is in limbo for a year. And he's like, okay, what if we turn it into a feature film? Mm -hmm. And he's like, all right, let me see. So they rewrite the script. It's expanded. Again, we're we're transforming the open-ended pilot into a feature film with a resolution of sorts. Yeah. He writes 18 extra pages of material that includes the romantic relationship between Rita and Betty and the events that occur after the blue box was opened. Mm -hmm. These are filmed in October of 2000, funded with $7 million from the French production company Studio Canal. And that's also what I find interesting, right? Because this is an R-rated movie. The only R-rated bits here are the sex scenes. I don't even think someone says fuck once in this movie. Or maybe, I'm sorry, we do in in the end, but not in any of the pilot material. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, because it would have just been immediately cut. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So Mulholland Drive premiered at the 2001 Cannes Film Festival uh, in May to major critical acclaim. Uh, yep. Lynch was awarded the Best Director Prize at the festival, sharing it with mm-hmm. Joel Cohen for the man who wasn't there, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, it drew positive reviews from many critics uh, and some of the strongest audience reactions of Lynch's career, which, again, I do think it's because it's just. Yeah, it's because he's a name brand, so people are like, ooh, David Lynch, but I also don't like him. And then they watch this and they go, wait, do I? Because I actually kind of get most of this. Ebert was one of them. Ebert had, like, disliked all of Lynch's previous work. He hated Blue Velvet. He hated Wilder Hardy. he fucking hated Blue Velvet so much. I will Mm -hmm. never forget that Ebert review. It's, like, (laughs) cemented in my brain. Well, and this is the first one. He's like, this is the first film of Lynch's where the surrealism works. And I was like, okay, well, you do you. fuck you, Ebert. (laughs) But I'm surprised that you, you saw it in theaters joe because universal pictures released mulholland drive theatrically in 66 theaters on october 12th 2001 oh gosh maybe i didn't see it in theaters then maybe i did see it on dvd release it grossed about five hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars over its opening weekend the biggest release it had was 247 theaters so it never went wide but Mm -mm. i mean were you in toronto at this time no i would have been in ottawa at the time i mean maybe ottawa has a is one of these 247 theaters <laughs> maybe it does have a vibrant you know uh art cinema scene oh actually here we go never mind i, I spoke too soon so 
anyway, it grosses about $7.2 million in the U.S., but TVA Films released the film theatrically in Canada yeah. on October 26, 2001. So you may have seen it, actually. Okay, okay, there we go, there we go. Uh, it grosses about $12.9 million outside of the U.S. for a worldwide total of $20 million. But we are looking at a budget of $15 million, and I don't mm-hmm. know if that includes... The Seven. The Seven. I would imagine it does because I, I can't so. see ABC giving them fifteen million dollars for a pilot. Uh, no, because I'm thinking back to like the days of Lost when they had, I think it was like ten million dollars or twenty million dollars mm-hmm. for their pilot, but it was a huge deal. So I can't imagine they would have given David Lynch fifteen. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Lynch was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Director. It's the yes. only Academy Award nomination the film got. He did not win. Ugh. Also, <laughs> Naomi Watts is right fucking there, people. She does get some some accolades, just not from the Academy. From the Hollywood Foreign Press, you know, the Golden Globes, it gets four noms, which include Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, and Best Original Score for Angela Badalamenti. Yes. And, I mean, Naomi Watts, she, she won Best Actress at the Chicago Critics Awards. She won Best Actress at the National Society of Film Critics. And she won at the Online Film Critics Society. So, okay. She had accolades, just not from, um, well, right. the Golden Globes that no one cares about or the Academy Awards. Hmm. It was named Best Picture by the New York Film Critics Circle at the 2001 New York Film Critics Circle Awards. It's often regarded as one of Lynch's finest works. Yes. It was ranked 28th in the 2012 Sight and Sound Critics Poll of the Best Films Ever Made. Mm. And finally, topped a poll, a 2016 poll by BBC Culture of the best films since the year 2000. Yeah. You said off the top, you're like, I'm not sure if we should call it a classic. And part of that, I think, is that we're hesitant to say films that have been made in the last quarter century are right. classics. But really, this is, you know, there's a reason it got picked up by Criterion. There's a reason that people still talk about it. And honestly, it feels like every time Lynch comes up, people say, if I'm going to watch a Lynch film, I'm probably thinking, okay, yeah, Mulholland Drive is a pretty good one, especially if you're looking to introduce people. It's often Twin Peaks. It's often Mulholland Drive or Blue Velvet. I was going to say, I think Blue Velvet, because admittedly, I don't remember Blue Velvet that much, but I do feel like that narrative is pretty straightforward as well. Um Yes. Yeah. It doesn't have quite as much of the dream logic as some of the other films do, like I I never said my introduction aside from Twin Peaks was actually Lost Highway. That was the first Lynch film that I saw. <laughs> and oh boy, was that a rough entry into his oeuvre because that film is complete. I was about to say nonsensical. It's not. It's just one story divided into two parts and you have to like really wrap your head around it because characters <gasps> change names and change faces and oh. so on. Like... That's the thing, right? He dabbles in the same kinds of imagery and themes and character types. And a lot of them are traditionally based in old Hollywood things. He's very well informed in this regard. So really, if you can find one aspect of Lynch that you like, you will see that through line in a lot of his other work. Yeah. And so before we go into your plot, just to kind of go into Lynchian, I guess, Mm -hmm. we've talked about it a lot already, but just how surreal and dreamlike, at least Mulholland Drive is, but honestly, a lot of his work. So Mulholland Drive is given the tagline, a love story in the city of dreams, which is, Mm -hmm. I'm going to say reductive, (laughs) (laughs) but Lynch refused to comment on Mulholland Drive's meaning or symbolism, leading to Mm -hmm. much discussion and multiple interpretations. Oh, sure. At Cannes, he uh, insisted that it tells a coherent, comprehensible story, which I would agree with. But like I said before, he forces the audience into the role of becoming the detectives themselves to make sense of the narratives. Mm -hmm. Mulholland Drive frustrates the spectator's need for a rational diegesis, which again is just fancy film talk for narrative, Mm -hmm. (laughs) by playing on the spectator's mistake that narration is synonymous with diegesis, which, oh, look, I just like totally uh, contradicted myself. (laughs) we're always one step behind the narration and thus narration prevails over diegesis but this is a mystery not because it allows the audience to view the solution to a question but because the film itself is a mystery that is held together by the spectator detective's desire to make sense of it Mm -hmm. and i can see how that's frustrating for some people and honestly i'm surprised it's not frustrating for me yeah me too I think just when I'm, I mean, it does give me comfort when Lynch is like, oh no, it's whatever you want it to be. Because 
as we've said before, I deal with very much like black and white, yes, no, literalism. But I guess when given the permission by the director to be like, oh, no, it's whatever you want it to be. There is no right answer. Mm -hmm. I feel like like chains have been loosed off of me in a way. Okay, okay, I can see that. Yeah, I really like that aspect of Lynch because he's not just unafraid to kind of play outside of the notions of traditional rules of filmmaking. He's very much outside of the Hollywood studio system in that regard, where he's not interested in telling a linear storyline, a storyline that makes sense, uh, a storyline where everything even wraps up. He's also outside of the world of the film, completely uninterested in talking about his own ambitions or goals for films. Like when you said he refused to talk about what the film means or like how it all wraps up, it's like, yeah. Because that's what David Lynch does. He <laughs> he will not answer questions from people about things. Possibly my favorite tidbit info fact about this film. I remember I liked it so much that I bought it on DVD when it came out. Mm. And partially because I really wanted to watch the final sequence, the parts that he adds after yeah. he got the money to come back and remake it. So I pick it up and I try to go to scene selection. Trace, have you mm. tried this on your Criterion? Oh, you can't, can you? There's no scene selection. You have to watch <laughs> the film all the way through, or you have to fast forward it like a dumb dumb. Because yes. he doesn't want you to watch scenes out of order. He doesn't want you to watch a particular scene in isolation. It's part of his process. But if you think about it, it almost runs counter to how he frames the film. In order to get this full experience, you have to experience all the parts, even if you think that they're not important interesting and you know i did catch that because i was trying to put subtitles on and i, I keep running into this issue with uh, my criterion sets because there there wasn't a subtitles option but if i press the subtitle button on my remote they mm -hmm. pop up yeah. so i was very frustrated <laughs> yeah you're like jesus christ just let me do what i want to do disc the answer is no <laughs> i do want to point out you know i say oh i felt more free to like look into different interpretations of this film because the creator himself has said oh no like it's whatever you want it to be and mm -hmm. oh my god that's so reductive and auteurist of you trace no it, it is it's unfair because again like what do we do on this podcast show we give readings to things normally through mm -hmm. normally always through a queer lens <laughs> but you know i mean as of this recording you know we have recently done an episode on creature from the black lagoon and we got some pushback from bloody disgusting commenters who were like oh you can't say that because the creators didn't say that it was queer like blah 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 oh, sure. it's like oh, so, i mean th these people are going to hear this because they're not going to make it you know 30 minutes into this episode <laughs> oh they don't even make it past the opening credits which is part of the problem but yes go on yeah but it's like why why am i more comfortable being like loose with my interpretations of Mulholland Drive when I should be able to do it with other films, which is why I like that we do this podcast because the podcast and you also force me to be like, well, no, just apply a reading to it. Because mm -hmm. as we say countless fucking times, <laughs> art is subjective as soon as it leaves the creator. And as a viewer, as a consumer of art, you are putting your life experiences into what you're watching, seeing, reading, hearing, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's the reading you make from it. And sure. that's also what makes this movie so fun. Well, yeah. And particularly when the creator says, like, I'm sure David Lynch knows exactly what he was trying to do with this film, but mm -hmm. he's so disinterested in telling it to us because he would rather have us tell him about our experiences or make them up for ourselves. So literally he's saying like, go off, do your podcast about my movie because you're <laughs> not wrong. Anything you say will be right. Which is ingenious, right? It's like, how do you make a movie timeless? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, just make it like this, and people will just keep talking about it. They'll want to theorize. You go to, like, there's a MulholandDrive.net, because I was trying to figure out if the uh, the singer that Adam is making his movie about was a real person or if it was a film invention. Mm -hmm. It's a film invention. But, yeah. like, there's still, like, this, like, really old, like, you know, early 2000s website of people just theorizing about what's going on in Mulholland Drive. And it's mm -hmm. just like... Oh, that's so fun. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, what we'll do is we'll take a trip to Paris, France, and we will go to Club Silencio and watch a show there and see if we can figure it all out. Okay. Because <laughs> there is an actual fucking Club Silencio in Paris. Oh, okay. So I'm going to say this now so I don't forget it later, but this is a fun, quick anecdote. So the singer of Club Silencio is Rebecca Del Rio, and she gets a whole fucking song. If anyone has seen Richard Kelly's Southland Tales, Richard Kelly, the director of Johnny Darko and The Box. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Del Rio, also playing herself, also singing a song, mm -hmm. <laughs> appears in the climax of that movie. And 
much like Mulholland Drive, Southland Tales is a <laughs> it is linear, but it doesn't make a lot of sense. There's a right. lot going on. It's also two and a half hours. It did mm-hmm. not have a successful can screening. No. But watching this, I was like, holy fuck, that's Rebecca Del Rio from Southland Tales. It's clear if you go watch Southland Tales now, you'll be like, oh, he was really probably inspired a lot by Mulholland Drive. Yeah. <laughs> or just Lynch in general. Right. Yeah. Or it's a shared cinematic universe. Honestly, maybe. Wouldn't put it past either of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> tell you, you what imagine? we'll we'll do we'll do southland tales one day how's that we'll cover it one day absolutely <laughs> and listeners if you don't know what it is just go google it and look at the cast because your your jaw will drop yeah because what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> um okay well move on <laughs> yeah yeah so um i'm gonna introduce a reading that i will probably reference a couple of times throughout Mm -hmm. this and that is justin holiday's article this is the girl queer nightmares fantasy and reality in mulholland drive it's from gender forum issue 72 and um yeah we talked about this a little bit before we started recording we're not going to do this as a traditional beat by beat plot recap just because some of the things ultimately don't pay off that would also probably make it about three hours long yeah so we're going to do this as a kind of a plot b plot and then we'll do anything else that we want to talk about at the end so we're going to focus on betty and rita and then we're going to circle back and talk about adam and then we're going to talk about the ending and then uh, we'll see where it goes from there so when we say talk about Betty and Rita, we talk about Adam. You mean like as soon as the blue box is opened, we're going to stop Betty and Rita and go back to Adam. Correct. Yes, okay. because that's really where the stories intersect. I mean, there is a, you know, a meet cute on the set, but uh, we'll kind get of. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we begin with a Canadian ingenue named Betty, who is played by Naomi Watts. And she is subletting her aunt's apartment on Sunset Boulevard. And this is where (laughs) she discovers an amnesiac brunette femme fatale, played by Laura Elena Herring, and she is hiding inside. I love how you were like, we begin! I'm like, no, actually, Naomi Watts appears 20 minutes into this movie. Oh yeah, I'm uh, I'm synthesizing a lot, so it's fine. Interject it's fine. whenever you like. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, but I, I should point out immediately from Watts' introduction, it's. I mean, she, she said that she took um inspiration from like you know Hollywood glamour like Tippi Hedren, and you can mm-hmm. see it. This bright eyed, bubbly, and also from the get go, this very surreal like with the old woman Irene who's with her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you're like, oh, wait, are these her parents? Is this someone that she knows? Did she just meet them on the plane? And as always. The answer is yes, because we don't know who these elderly folks are. But then, okay, so again, the first two hours of this film, I don't think are too surreally dreamlike. I actually think the way the film is shot and edited and cut, like, it feels more dreamlike in that last 30 minutes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But we get moments, like... Irene and this and her partner man mm-hmm. in the cab driving away and the yes. camera just holds on them as they mm-hmm. are smiling. Yeah, and it's unnerving yes. and a little creepy and nefarious even like wait, what is their story? And the answer is we don't know. Uh we don't know. And when we talk about the ending, they'll come back in for a little a little <laughs> bit. Boo, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will say everything that you need to know about the Betty character, because she is potentially a character. Mm -hmm. Everything that we need to know about who she is, is really well encapsulated in this introduction. She is so bright. She's so sunny. She's everything that you know of young women who set foot in Los Angeles to become a star because they want to make movies and you just know, oh shit, the system is going to stomp all over these girls and send them home, hopefully not dead. And I love the way that Lynch subverts that moment where she's saying goodbye to Irene and whatever that dude's name is. And then she turns around and she thinks her bags have been stolen, Mm -hmm. but it's actually just the cab driver putting them into the trunk. Yes, it does that. And it's so fascinating. I'm honestly surprised he didn't have her burst into song because this actually feels like it <laughs> feels like an old Holly- yeah it feels like an old Hollywood musical where she's like yes. I'm coming up the plane I'm in L A I'm mm-hmm. gonna dance on the street oh the cab <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah I mean this movie is really steeped in a lot of old Hollywood stuff it's not only mixing 
pretty much every genre that you can think of, but it's also really drawing on old Hollywood glamour and that kind of stuff. Like the Rita stuff is the most obvious, but there's Mm -hmm. a lot more going on than just that. Well, and I think that's why the film opens with like a minute long dance sequence to like Mm -hmm. 30s and 40s swing music where it's just like, okay, this is the tone of Betty's world here. Or I guess, you know, Diane, if we want to call her that. Um, hello, that's how Betty got her ticket to Los Angeles, Trey. She won a jitterbug contest (laughs) in Canada. Oh, when she said, I I rewound it, I was like, did she say Ottawa? (laughs) She did not. But uh, she did say a smaller town in Ontario. Yes. Ontario. There you go. There you go. Okay. (laughs) Another O. I got it. Yeah, it's good stuff. Okay. So she does discover this woman. This woman, she renames herself Rita after seeing the picture of Rita Hayworth on the Gilda poster, which is in the aunt's bathroom. (laughs) And I do love that shot of her looking at herself in the mirror, seeing the poster reflected because you're like mirrors and doubles and everything is not what it seems yeah again we'll we'll talk about queer readings for this film but i saw like one queer reading and they were like oh yeah doubles and mirrors feature prominently which are very heavy in in lesbian like texts and i'm like is it Hmm. like (laughs) i didn't know that (laughs) i mean i'm thinking back to mirror mirror there you go um also i do want to point out so i mean naomi watts gets obviously a lot of rightfully deserved praise for this movie and i don't think laura herring gets the same amount of praise she barely gets a fraction Except from Ebert. Ebert was like, oh, she could be Gilda. If if there's ever a Gilda remake, like, she can be Gilda. But, you know, like, look at Naomi Watts' career. And the last thing I saw Laura Herring in was the American remake of Inside. Yeah. People don't give her performance credit because they think that she's just playing a dazed woman. And you're like, yeah, but she also plays the shades within that and also the curiosity and, like, to say, oh, well, this person doesn't know who they are and therefore they're a boring cipher. Mm, I don't think you're quite giving her the justice. Well, and she's she's filling the femme fatale role in the film, right? Yes. Like, I mean, not actively per se, because at least in these first two hours, like, she doesn't know who she mm-hmm. is. But she's still this enigma of a character. Like, she's yes. a blank slate. And I guess, yeah, people think that that's, I guess, the less interesting part to play, which admittedly, it's the less showy part. Right. And that's that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, which that's just how it works. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the film actually began with her in a limo driving up Mulholland Drive, and she was the near victim of an attempted assassination before Mm -hmm. surviving a car accident. And then she stumbled down into the house. So now we've got the two women, and they're trying to piece this together. I do love the fact that it takes Betty ages to figure out that Rita is not your aunt's friend. And she still doesn't call the police, even when her aunt is like, uh, who is in my house? Because she loves her, Joe. Her lesbian desires are awakening. Mm -hmm. Did you Mm -hmm. notice that? I mean, if we're going with this whole dream theory, like, oh, this is like, you know, Diane's dream or whatever. I caught this on my second watch today, but whenever Rita like crosses the street and she's about to fall asleep in like the grass, because that's what she does. She sleeps constantly in this movie. It's true. Yeah. A couple walks up to her like on the sidewalk and they're just laughing and laughing and laughing, but like overly so, like to the point where it's kind of creepy. Mm-hmm. And it matches the laughing that Adam and Camilla do at the very end of the movie at the dinner table. Oh, so wow. again, if we're doing like dream logic here, it's like, oh, okay, so Diane is like using mm-hmm. that visual and oral sensation and like putting it on these random strangers that walk by Rita in her dream. Yeah. It's interesting. So folks, if you haven't listened to our guest spot on Nightlife when we talked about high tension, you might be wondering, well wait, when you did that film, you <laughs> talked about how fucking pissed off you were that everything in the movie was basically a dream. And I would say that Mulholland Drive not only works actively better as the first two hours are all a dream, but more specifically, the reason it works here is because everything that we're seeing is actually actively feeding into the revelation at the end of the film, as opposed to the revelation taking the wind out of the sails of the entire movie. Yeah, and like there are things that don't make sense in Mulholland Drive, but yes. when you apply the dream logic... You can watch this movie and say, no, it's not a dream. Or you can Mm -hmm. say, um, oh, no, the end of the movie is a dream. It's a nightmare of what Betty is experiencing, which I don't subscribe to that at all. But no, you you can. (laughs) You can do that. (laughs) But there's also like visual and thematic motifs Mm -hmm. and through lines here that a lesser film like High Tension doesn't have. (laughs) Yeah. I'm so careful to avoid overpraising Lynch, but honestly, 
I just really admire Lynch so much, and I really think that he is an expert craftsman at putting all of this together, and Mulholland Drive really is, it's almost a highlight reel for what he's able to do in terms of, like, piecing everything together while still remaining true to his what-the-fuck-is-going-on-ness. So I don't know if you saw this in your research, but so with the DVD that came out with this film, this is 2002, it included a card that said David Lynch's 10 Clues to Unlocking This Thriller. (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah no and I, I told my husband about it because my husband loves this movie and he was like oh, i watched that like i've seen it like 20 times like he used to watch it in college a lot mm-hmm. but they would him and his friends would pull out the card and read it and like have like, have it on hand when they were watching the movie uh-huh. so it was like notice the appearances of the red lampshade that's clue number two number five who gives a key and why hmm. 10 where is aunt ruth like it, uh, there's a bunch of these clues and it's like I honestly think this is just Lynch trolling audiences. <laughs> it definitely feels like giving people that kind of sensory, I, I don't know, some kind of experience. Like he wants to turn this into more than just a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I view this movie as a tragedy. Like it's a tragedy. And when we get into the queer readings of it too, about yeah. we, we can discuss whether it's offensive or not or oh, whatever, but yeah, I, I very much view this as a tragedy. I do. Yeah. Okay, so Betty does allow Rita to stay, despite the concerns of building manager Coco, who is played by Ann Miller. Uh, so kooky. Uh, yeah. <laughs> giving you a centric, aging out actress who now runs a building vibes very well. Might as well be Melrose Place. More or less, yeah. Seedier. <laughs> well, actually, I do love that we get a compare and contrast between this and the Sierra Bonita place, mm-hmm. where you're just like, oh, one is obviously being maintained and one has gone to seed a little bit well i love this too this la fantasy for betty because it's like she gets there she's not working she has no job Mm -hmm. i mean i guess like again she's staying at the her aunt's place rent free yes but but again lynch's clue where is aunt ruth where where is she joe i don't know she went to canada to film a movie (laughs) how convenient that you came from canada and then your aunt is going to canada Hmm. yeah there you go (laughs) the clue is answered there we go So speaking of the clue, the two women decide that they're going to set out to solve this mystery. And that's in part because when they open up Rita's purse to see if she has ID, they discover, as you mentioned, quite a large sum of money and also a very stylized blue key. Mm -hmm. Do you make any significance of the color blue in this? Um, I'm not asking because I I don't have one. I'm just wondering. (laughs) You know, had I given it some thought, I'm sure I probably could have pulled something up. But yeah, I mean, like the blues and the reds are pretty strong. And blue is often coded as mystery, right? Like there's Mm -hmm. the blue smoke when they go to Club Silencio. The woman in Club Silencio is with the blue hair. Yeah. 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 So they have the money. They have the key. They have no fucking idea what is going on. So Betty makes the pretty clever idea to say well why don't we call the police and see whether or not your car accident is real so they don't want to do that from a line that can be traced so they walk to the winkies and they use the pavement outside this is where we again like for me this is a big clue where she's like it'll be just like in the movies we'll pretend to be Mm -hmm. other people just like you're doing right now diane Hmm. yeah it's the kind of meta commentary that i really like because it It feels very on par with like, oh, we're watching a movie set in Hollywood, so they're going to talk about movies. But also then when you know the end of the film, you're like, wait, there's an extra meaning to that, too. Well, yeah, because there's so many moments in this film that call out that it is a movie or a dream, like Mm -hmm. uh, the the machinations of Diane's uh, subconscious or whatever the fuck. And it's just, again, it's just just fun. It's fun to watch. Mm Mm-hmm. So they call the police. They do discover that, yes, there was a car accident, but no, they don't gather any more details. So they go inside and they get some coffee. And uh, there's a fascinating moment when you know to look for it. Betty really makes eyes at the waitress, whose name is Diane. And Mm -hmm. they have a bit of a flirty connection, but they also look very similar. And Diane's haircut is the same haircut that Betty will have when she transforms into Diane into at Diane. the end of the film. Which, I mean, again, so I, I'm going with that. Like, okay, well, that's clearly what Diane's... Because I know we're at the end. Like, I'm, I'm bringing up the end. But, like, Diane is the quote-unquote real version of Betty. Mm-hmm. And she really works at the diner, Winkies. Which, I guess... Oh, see, now I'm going through this. So maybe, like, 
the monster behind the diner is like also like her like depression manifested that's just attacking people Ooh, yeah well people often read it as a manifestation they usually say that it's a manifestation of her guilt Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean yeah well that's what the money too is right that's the hitman money yeah exactly uh okay so the name tag itself actually prompts rita to remember a name which is diane selwyn and uh, they look her up in the phone book and realize, OK, well, we can call her. And when they try and they get an answering machine, they say, well, tell you what, we'll go and visit her later. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is where I'm going to bring in Holiday briefly. So Holiday's yeah. article says their relationship becomes queer, not only because their physical desire for one another, but also because their need to unravel the mystery whose strangeness becomes attached to their bodies, as emphasized by the growing erotic tension between them that culminates in a sexual encounter. So this idea that the mystery is literally within their bodies, and then it becomes queer by virtue of activating the mystery. Mm, I pulled that quote too, so I'm glad you said it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But of course, before we can solve any more mysteries, we do have to do the quote unquote, very Hollywood thing. Trace, we need to have an audition scene. Oh my God. Have you been more uncomfortable watching a movie? Like, oh, I love it. Again, it's another moment of subversion where I just did not expect it the first time I watched this because you see her play it out and you think, okay, yeah, you know, I love that they laugh at how bad the script is because it is lurid melodrama, which Mm -hmm. P.S. is also the movie that we're watching. Yep. And then she goes in and immediately reads this room, figures out that that is not going to work because this motherfucker whose name is Woody and he is a pervert, like a (laughs) pervert named Woody. He is a pervert. (laughs) And so she plays it like a seduction and she becomes the femme fatale, which again, very telling when you think about where we're about to go. Yeah, I mean, she goes to a dark place here because there's a moment where he's he's about to grab her ass and he hesitates and she makes the choice then and there. Mm -hmm. Like, nope, grab my ass. Let's do it. I also just love it because I, I find acting just fascinating. Like, I mean, watching back to back scenes where she plays these lines one way and then mm-hmm. in another scene a completely different way. I just I know it's silly to be like, "Oh my god, it's acting. Look how good it is." But it's like <laughs> <laughs> she's really good. Yeah, she is. Yeah. And then of course, yeah, she blows the whole room away and the the casting director that they can't afford but is still in the room for some reason mm-hmm. um is like, "Let me just take you to Mr. Justin Thoreau." Yeah. I think one of the things I really appreciate about this is that in a lesser film, this would have been with maybe just her and Woody would have been the actual director and there would have been a casting couch situation. And instead, it's just a really uncomfortably cramped office with way too many people in it. And she just dazzles them. And that is the unexpected piece. Like the film says, I know what you think I'm going to do, but I'm not going to give it to you. And well, it's actually a very accurate representation of how those kind of auditions go. Not not the creep factor of it, but just that you're in a small room with a bunch of people. Um, whenever we were uh, we we covered the remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for uh, the Patreon plug, mm-hmm. they have the audition tapes for like Jessica Biel and Erica Learson, and they're just like sitting in a chair in a gray bland office, yeah. screaming their asses off. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so believable. I can totally envision that she's being chased by Leatherface as yeah. she sits in this chair in this gray ass office. <laughs> and then they just turn it off like they're done screaming and they're like, all right, yeah. scene. <laughs> and I'm good. Thanks. Oh, did you say cut? Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, no, the, the, the audition scene is great. I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. So after this audition, she is told, okay, well, this movie is going to be garbage. So here, let me lady to lady you take you to a better set with more interesting people. Mm -hmm. So Diane, ooh, Freudian slip. So Betty is taken to this active set where Adam Kesher, who is played by Justin Throw, and we'll get to him more in a little Mm -hmm. bit. He is directing auditions for his own female lead and the two of them lock eyes. And it's a very telling moment, but it's also a very big Hollywood cliche. So I will now bring in a quote from the same piece that you've been pulling from. So, in Mulholland Drive, Watts' character consistently rejects heterosexual possibility, instead following queer temporalities. After the uncomfortable audition with Woody, a casting agent takes Betty to Adam Kesher's film set, and the two separate narratives finally converge, which, again, we'll talk about Adam more later. Mm -hmm. 
But Betty and Cash's eyes meet in perhaps the greatest cliche of cinema to underscore heterosexual desire as the default position. Because, yeah, in, in your normal Hollywood film, oh, director and star meet. It's a match made in heaven. They're mm-hmm. in love. And honestly, this scene plays like it. You could totally imagine that if this had have gone to series, the two of them would have been making moon eyes and he would have regretted his choice of going with Camilla and he would have been like, ah, oh, shit, I got to get Betty in here somehow. Well, and I think that's also why the film they're making is set in, I'm going to say the 60s, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's it's calling to mind that type of narrative that you mm-hmm. would see in the 60s. Yeah. So while, of course, we get this meet cute, while this like 60s bop number is being sa- sung by a one actress and then in comes Melissa George and lip syncs it. And yes. I'm like, that's not Melissa George's voice. I that know her is voice. Not. Nope. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, so the, the article continues. Um, Betty then runs away, telling the cast and director she has to meet her friend. While lesbian desire has remained latent so far, this scene is not a case of misromantic connection. Rather, Betty running away signifies her choice of Rita over Kesher. Mm-hmm. Even if she can currently can only situate that desire within the language of the friendship, having the two almost meet acts as a rejection of the heteronormative script, wherein the leading male and female characters must eventually fall in love. Yep. Honestly, this reminds me of Nightmare on Elm Street, too. Jesse has the opportunity to make out with Lisa Uh in the cabana, and he runs to Grady instead. He's just going to him because he's his friend. (laughs) Same with Betty and Rita here. Oh, I've just got to, I made a promise to a friend. So even though this is a huge career opportunity and I just locked eyes with that hot dude, I got to run and help my friend. That's the subtitle for this episode. It's just like Nightmare on Elm Street 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And then David Lynch comes to my house and shoots me. <laughs> no, he's going to be like, oh, my God, you're right. <laughs> oh, my yes. God. Everything you're thinking is right. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So, yes, the two women, uh, they travel to Sierra Bonita and they break into Diane Selwyn's apartment. I have to give a shout out to this lesbian neighbor who... (laughs) I thought she was a lesbian too! (laughs) I love her because she is a bitch. She is abrupt. She does not give a fuck. I did not take the actress's name down. I don't even know if this character has a name. She's great. I love her. And she actually stays the same between Mm -hmm. realities. Like She does not change from this dream world, quote unquote, to Mm -hmm. the real, quote unquote, world. Love it. Love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they end up breaking into Diane Selwyn's apartment. And of course, what they discover is a bloated body of a woman who is dead on the bed. Yeah. Yep. I'm trying to think of what I want to say to this. I, I know. Like... But every time I watch this, I look and I, I go, that doesn't look like Naomi Watts's body. But it's like deformed by decay. Still. Exactly. Which is why yeah. I said bloated, because she's clearly been there for a while. You know, when they come in, they cover their mouths because the smell is so bad. Mm-hmm. There's flies on the audio and so on. But it is always interesting to me to watch that transition when the cowboy comes in as we make the switch. And mm-hmm. you can see the body transform into Naomi Watts. And you're like, oh, I guess it is her. Okay. Yeah. I do love this little, I mean, again, it's like a, it's not even lynching. It's just a trick. But like whenever they run out and the visual echoes. Mm-hmm. of them yes yeah it's a, it's like one frame starts and the next one the next one the next one it, this is where it kind of starts to get really surreal for me well and really if you think about it it's her dream self discovering her real dead self mm-hmm. and her mind is kind of fragmenting right right well okay <sighs> i know i know <laughs> i don't know if I ever, i'm like don't want to talk about this now well because okay so spoiler alert everyone naomi watts dies she dies by suicide at the end of this movie because mm-hmm. i'm like okay well when is she dreaming i'm like for me it's kind of like oh um okay have you ever seen i'm gonna spoil this for you if you haven't seen it but it's called the life before her eyes with uma thurman and ava amori i've heard of it i haven't seen it okay so basically um it's gonna sound familiar but it's about a school shooting and what happens in the beginning is it's young uma thurman who's evan rachel wood and ava amori are in a bathroom the school shooter comes in and ava amori dies and Evan Rachel Wood lives. And so it flashes forward like 20, 30 years, and it's Uma Thurman, and she's really depressed, blah, 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 blah. The whole movie goes by. It's how her life is just miserable. She's residual guilt from being the survivor. Mm-hmm. Um, the movie ends with a twist reveal, because okay. the movie is called The Life Before Her Eyes. Right. That basically, Eva Mori did not die. What happened is Evan Rachel Wood jumped in front of the bullet and took it herself and died. And the entire movie right. is The Life Before Her Eyes that she would have seen. And it's basically her justifying mm-hmm. sacrificing herself because she she knows her friend Ava Amori would have had a better life, will make better use of her life than herself. Oh, interesting. 
Whereas here, I would have just gone with sliding doors. But yes. Well, <laughs> see, for me, though, I'm like, no, this to me, like this whole dream sequence is the split second between like her pulling the trigger and her actually dying mm. of like, this is what I wanted my life to be if my life were good or something. Right. Well, and it's not hard to speculate that in those final scenes where Diane, aka the Betty character in quote unquote real life, she is very clearly upset and possibly suicidal and she's sleeping a lot, right? Like she's having hallucinations. She's mm -hmm. confusing reality with dreams, much like what the film is actually doing. And it's not hard for me to imagine that she is dreaming all of this in between thinking, okay, well, this is probably going to end with me killing myself because of what I've done. See, I'm watching it like, oh, we're walking into this room. But like, she's like, oh, I'm dead because I'm literally like, I've just killed myself. Right. You know what? Know what David Lynch says? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Right. But you can also view it as, yeah, it's a metaphor for like, her soul is dead. Like, it's not her literally dying. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. her, her career, you can even view it as her career. Her career is rotting on this bed. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. David Lynch says yes. <laughs> okay. So they are understandably freaked out. Rita has a bit of a breakdown. This is when <laughs> Betty styles her a wig because this is what you do if you're pretending to be Hitchcock blondes, I guess. Well, it's very vertigo-y, but mm -hmm. also single white female-y. Uh, yes, yeah. I do like the idea that, I mean, we, we've talked about the conflation of women who look very similar. And I can't mm -hmm. help but think that that's also a commentary by Lynch about the way that Hollywood treats women and kind of use them as interchangeable. Like, just slap a blonde wig on her. Yeah, blonde ingenues. Pretty face, bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, again, we're going into a queer reading here. Maybe not yet, but it's kind of like this negative predatory lesbian depiction where it's like, I'm going to make you look just like me. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, we've also had conversations about gay couples who look almost identical to one another. You're mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah. yeah, sure. Styler like you, if that's what turns you on. Well, because at this point... This is where we get the sex scene. <sighs> okay, I was like, yeah, they're about to have sex. If they haven't yes. had sex yet, they're about to have sex. I mean, she basically crawls into bed and then says, Oh, Rita, you don't need to stay on the couch. Just crawl into this large bed with me, but also take off the wig. Because it's like she doesn't want to have sex with herself. But <laughs> um, my favorite porn setup, by the way. Oh, roommate. Oh, my God. You don't have a bed yet. Ugh, don't sleep on the couch. Please come into bed. It's OK. Oh, you sleep naked, bro. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> is it OK? I mean, yeah, I guess. Oops, we're touching penises. I will say that moment where she's like, yeah, just get into bed next to me. <laughs> and then Laura Lena Herring just like doffs the top and the boobs are out. And I think, <laughs> oh, OK. I guess when I invite people to sleep in my bed, like, you know, You've gone out to a night at the bars with friends and it's like crash over at my place. If they just like whip their dick out, I'd be like, oh, OK, I guess that's a different kind of sleep in my bed situation. <laughs> you know, so obviously this scene was added. Um, this was not yes. in the TV pilot because it can't show titties on ABC. Whenever Lynch brought the pilot back around to Watts and Herring, because he went to them first. He was like, hey, it's going to be a movie now, but we're going to add some stuff. Also, there's going to be nudity. Right. Um, I think Herring was like a little hesitant at first, mm -hmm. but he's like, you know, he obviously described to them what it was going to be like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm a man, but like, I actually do think that this love scene is filmed very tastefully mm -hmm. and it's also very sexy. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I think both of these actresses look really, really good. And oh, my God, I just canceled myself. Um, <laughs> I think that they are shot so that they look at the height of their beauty, like it is also very much a male fantasy and it is very male gazy in that way. But I also feel like that's a very deliberate decision because Lynch knows this. Like he's making a film about interchangeable women and sexism in Hollywood. And then he gives you a super hot lesbian makeout scene. It's deliberate. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, in this big budget studio release, and it's not that, because it, it went to 250 theaters. And there we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they do sleep together, and then in the middle of the night, Rita begins saying the word, silencio, mm -hmm. silencio, silencio. Sorry, I'll okay. stop. So <laughs> this is the name of a club. So they hop in a cab in the middle of the night. We do get a fantastic dolly push-in shot as they go in the doors it reminds me of the evil dead a little bit yeah a little bit i can see that 
and this is honestly, I think if you're watching this for the first time, like there have been some things before this that you're like, what the fuck? This is the scene mm-hmm. where you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, it's a hundred percent. Oh, welcome back to David Lynch. We are <laughs> watching a David Lynch movie. Yeah. Cause they go into this club and it is a theatrical performance that is basically all about how everything has been pre-recorded and nothing is live, but it is a trick to fool you and also enjoy the show. I have seen readings that says that Club Silencio is almost a stand-in. It's uh, Holiday who says it. It's a no place filled with contradictions where things both are and are not. But it's also a queer space because the girls are very actively touching one another. They are holding each other. They're sitting very closely. So I love that interpretation that in the world of the film, you know, their relationship is tenuous and not quite real. But also we're seeing this reflected back on the stage in the way that all of these different performances are portrayed. Well, that's the thing, right? Because they get there and the MC of the show keeps saying, no I banda means there is no band. Mm-hmm. Everything's an illusion. Everything's recorded. It's all yes. an illusion. So yeah, we can be ourselves here because yeah, this space is literally queer and queer in the sense as we speak it today. Mm-hmm. And so it's a safe space for them. They, they lose their tears, lose their tears. Yeah, sure. They, <laughs> they sob. <laughs> yes. They let loose with tears. Well, and like, like even Rebecca Darbio, like she's lip syncing. Oh, also good anecdote. So basically, when I guess prepping for this, someone went to Lynch and was like, "Oh, you should hear Rebecca Del Rio. She wants to sing for you." And they go to this recording studio, and she's already set up. She sings this song, this uh, this Spanish translation of Roy Orbison's "Cry, Crying, mm-hmm. Crying," and they use that recording from just the one, the one time, one take, whatever, as the lip sync track for her in this in this scene. I fucking love this musical number. Mm-hmm. It gives me shivers every time I watch this movie. Well, because her voice, her is, voice so is so good. powerful. And in Southland Tales, she sings Star Spangled Banner. And I've oh. never, ever, ever given a shit about the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> but it's a really good rendition of it. <laughs> okay. Well, I will stick with the Spanish version of Cry. How's that? That's fine. That's totally fine. I think one other important piece to think about, specifically with the way that this is taped performances presented as live it also echoes back to the falseness of what we're going to see in adam's sequence when he's auditioning the girls Mm, that makes sense that makes sense and i'll I'll use this quote again you can cut this out if it's just a restatement of what we've already said but um holiday continues though you know the two women can finally be together in public and express themselves however they wish because this space does not require them to respond within the linguistic realm but rather just to be. So again, with Twin Peaks, what, what the the red room, the curtain, like it's like a mm-hmm. limbo type space. That's kind yes. of how I view. Like Silencio is like the sister club, <laughs> whatever okay, that place to Black is. Lodge. There you go. Yes, Betty and Rita can express the pain and beauty of living, including living as queer women in a heterosexist world, just by touching one another, expressing their emotional reactions freely, and moving away from the linguistic cliches from earlier in the film. Yeah, I do like the fact that Holiday, in that quote, specifically addresses linguistics, because they do not say anything in this entire sequence. Mm, No, And, and that's the thing too, right? We're just watching two women watch this performance that we are also watching. Mm -hmm. And it's mesmerizing. Yeah, because really, again, if we're thinking of Lynch as creating a kind of sensory experience, like I'm thinking back to the card where he says, pay attention to this, like be immersed in the movie. Mm. We are as immersed as they are, despite the fact that we know that this is also fake and a recording. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exciting. Do you think there's, I mean, I'm sure there is significance to it, but yeah, Del Rio just collapses as Mm -hmm. the music continues. So what do we want to say that that even symbolizes? Yeah, I've always looked at it as it's just the confirmation that, oh, I managed to suck you in with this, even though it's not real. Yeah. Yeah. Which to me is like, hey, the first two hours of this film. No, I banda. Mm -hmm. There is no band, folks. Mm -mm. Mm Mm-mm. So almost immediately after this, Betty pulls a blue box out of her purse, and when they rush home to open it, before they can, Betty disappears, leaving only Rita to stick the key in, and then the camera zooms into the darkness, and this would technically be where we would address what happens at the end, but we're going to double back because this is a Lynchian episode, so we're going to go back to Adam and tell Adam's Mm. story now. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, Adam. Do we like Adam? So... 
I think Adam is fascinating because of the way Lynch does him in the first two hours versus the reality. I'm using air quotes at the party. (laughs) He seems like such a dumb, annoying punk, like a hot headed director who thinks that he's all that. Yeah, I really read it in his hair, which I know that that's not a thing that you pay attention to, but it's very spiky. No, no, no. Okay, no, no, no. Stop. So I reached out to you before this recording, and I was like, honestly, like, I know this is 1999 when they're filming this, but he looks to me like J.J. Abrams Mm -hmm. or Brian Singer in this movie. Yeah. And I was like, I I don't think that was intentional because, yeah, with the time this was filmed, like, it wouldn't make any sense. But that's just what J.J. Abrams and Brian Singer look like. And so I just imagine, like, oh, they're probably just the same kind of douchebags. Not sexual predators. He's a stand-in for the kind of wonder kid director who Mm -hmm. is up and coming and thinks yeah this is my movie and of course all of adam's stories about how just because you're the director just because you're the auteur doesn't mean you get to drive the plot again commentary by david lynch about just because the director says one thing doesn't mean that that's what anybody else gets to take away from it well and and adam's story seems so far removed from everything else that's happening honestly i remember the first time i watched this i was like i don't give a shit about this guy like yeah. i want to go back i want to go back to the girls. story <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh also you're gay yeah <laughs> but depending on how you read it you know I mean, it's like his entire arc for the first two hours of this film is just having shitty things happen to him oh i love it i find it so funny now Oh, it is funny, especially when you see how he is at the end of this movie. But also it's like, oh, OK, like if your spouse cheats on you and like, you know, you're more angry at the person your spouse cheated on you with than your mm-hmm. spouse themselves. Yes. Yeah. Obviously, you know, we have Diane like putting out a hit on Camilla. But it's like, yeah, this a, a Diane subconscious punishing Adam in her dream. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to fuck up your entire life in every possible way. Yeah. And it's also I mean, I can see where you're watching this and you're confused because Adam in the beginning and Adam in the end are the same person. Yeah. As opposed to Betty and Rita slash Diane and Camilla. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I, I think in the world of Diane, he's not even worth changing. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So Adam's storyline is that he is, yes, a director. He is working on a very hot project, which is the Sylvia North story. And as you mentioned, Trace, she is a fictitious star, but it is a kind of uh, retro pastiche set in the 60s, I guess, musical because she was a singer. So yeah. he is also being asked to recast his lead actress, and he is being actively told by, I read them as mobsters. I'm not yeah. sure if other people do. <laughs> no, I-, I think it's meant to be the mafia. What? Okay. Every time I watch this, I'm like, what the fuck is this doing here? Mm-hmm. The espresso scene? I love it. I... <laughs> the funny thing is, like, if you know anything about David Lynch, he loves coffee. coffee. Like, it's a huge part of Twin Peaks, but also he's been involved in, I think, coffee commercials. Like, he's done coffee commercials after Inland Empire. So coffee is a huge part of who David Lynch is. So I love this idea that it doesn't matter how good the coffee is. Angelo Badalamonte just goes, Bleh. <laughs> Did I get the name right? Yeah, I think it's Badalamenti, but it doesn't really matter. You, you were really close. <laughs> ah, points for effort. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, um, Angela Badalamenti, I mean, I think we'll get murdered or raked across the coals if we don't mention it, but um, very famous composer. Mm-hmm. He did compose, he does a lot of Lynch, yeah. uh, but he he's a horror quiz alumni because he did compose the remake, the score from the remake of The Wicker Man. Yes, yeah. I also absolutely love the score for Mulholland Drive. To me, it's the most evident when we see the limo going up the literal street. Yeah. Sorry, I, I had a revelation because, you, <laughs> no, you know how you mentioned Evil Dead? Mm-hmm. Did he do that too? So the, the cinematographer for this movie, Peter Deming, he shot Scream 2 through 4, he shot Lost Highway, he shot Austin Powers 1 and 3, but okay. he also shot Evil Dead 2. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do love a versatile uh, cinematographer, right? Eh? Yeah, exactly. <sighs> okay, so um, yeah, so the the purpose of this meeting is for Adam to be told, here is a headshot of a woman. She is the woman that you are going to recast. And he balks at this. He's absolutely not having it. And there are insinuations, and if we want to, we can talk about it at the end, that this kind of is part of a larger, vaster conspiracy because we do have the little person from twin peaks who is involved in this and there's a game of telephone with unseen people so goes all the way to the top 
the staging, right? So the little person, the character's name is Roke, and he's in a room in a chair mm-hmm. in the middle of it, and people come and talk to him through a pane of glass as he's as if he's on display, like in a zoo. Yes, like. <laughs> It's very Black Lodge, if we're being honest. Like, it looks like it could be filmed in the same set. And to then see what will happen in Twin Peaks The Return, which features a lot of this similar visual iconography, Mm -hmm. it honestly could be that Mulholland Drive is that long-lost Twin Peaks missing piece. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, But yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, watching this for the first time, even, you're like, okay, in the moment, you're like, that's really weird. But mm-hmm. honestly, because it never comes up again, no. you're just like, you forget about it by the end because there's so much other shit going on. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It's just a weird kind of odd piece. Again, like, I'm imagining this first season of the show, like, oh, the mafia stuff's going to get expanded upon. Oh, yeah, for sure. Although it does feel like the almost most complete storyline to me because it seems like by the end of Adam's arc here... He really has kind of caved and given in. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I also find it the least interesting part of the story, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, too, if it's also because this feels a little more neo-noir. Like, a lot of the mystery Nancy Drew stuff that Rita and Betty are doing is neo-noir, but Mm. it doesn't always feel that way because it's a mystery. Whereas here... It's mobsters, it's goons, it's shady, seedy motels, Mm -hmm. it's affairs and adultery and that kind of stuff. And you don't like noir. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess I like all the lady stuff. So basically, if you want me to like your noir, you need to put lesbians as your leads. Because this and Bound, this and Bound, (laughs) I'm all about. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. There we go. I was going to say Lady Noir, but sure. Lady Noir. Yeah, sure. I like Lady Noir. There you oh, go. God. It makes it sound like Lady Bic or something, you know, like Ooh. all those products that are <laughs> regular, but for women. Yes. But you know what would be kind of cool, though, is if we do like, okay, we do like a, a Neo Noir, because I guess we can't do Noir anymore, like whatever. But um, we have the women leads, but then instead of a femme fatale, it's a mask m- metal. <laughs> but it's like, oh, or it's like a gay guy. I don't know. I don't know. I think you could just say Mattel. Yeah. There you go. Mattel. It's a Mattel. It's a Mattel. <laughs> Mask Mattel. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, people are going to like that. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. After hitting the. Oh my God. Do we even care? I know. It's, yeah, his he, wife's he cheating on him. <laughs> he discovers his wife is cheating on him with Billy Ray Cyrus. And um, also, his wife is the co lead of your favorite movie, The In Crowd. Oh my god, no. <laughs> um, he goes into hiding because they still have people looking for him. I will say I laugh every time, even though I know I shouldn't, when the really big goon breaks into his house oh, and punches, punches his, his wife. wife. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. It is funny. I don't, I'm sorry. Like, I am it's not. It's terrible, but it's so funny. <laughs> I am not for violence against women. Obviously, I am not a misogynist, but that is funny. Yep. I mean, it's also really funny how Billy Ray Cyrus just goes down with one punch. Like, the whole situation is heightened comedy. Also, why is Billy Ray Cyrus here? (laughs) I don't know. He's he's the most inspired casting in this, and I love it. So we haven't mentioned yet, and it's a tiny, tiny thing, because he's in two scenes in this movie, but Mark Pellegrino, the hitman... Sorry, sorry. Mark Pellegrino, a.k.a. Jacob from Lost, when he goes and he kills Mateo from Anaconda, and we get that really great, like kind of comedic scene where he all, again beats up this fat receptionist mm-hmm. <laughs> and then shoots her. a janitor and then sets off a fire alarm yeah yes yeah, so he's an incompetent hitman but is he there to find out where alex lives some people have read it as he's trying to find adam's address and other adam. people have read it as oh because he's been hired by diane he's actually trying to find camilla Mm, gotcha 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 okay i mean the other fun thing is some people have seen this as a direct commentary or a conversation that lynch is having to the popularity of things like pulp fiction oh uh, i could see that i mean because this is a funny scene and it's yes. meant to be funny but it also yes. does feel so out of place narratively speaking mm-hmm. to the rest of the film <laughs> absolutely yeah it's just another little weird one so yeah um, okay, so Adam goes into hiding at the seedy motel. He ends up calling his assistant, a.k.a. Sunday, the actress who plays <laughs> Sunday from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yay! Honestly, so watching it again today, I was like, oh, I would never have picked her out of the crowd. No, she not. does not look anything like her character on the show. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
And he is told that you need to meet with a man called the cowboy. And he goes, do I want to meet with the cowboy? And she <laughs> says, yes, I think you do want to meet with the cowboy. Again, funny stuff. Yeah. Uh, this gentleman is played by Monty Montgomery, but I just called him Baby William Sadler for the uh, entire... One hundred percent. Also, and fun tidbit that I got from the Criterion Blue. So this guy could not remember his lines at all. So oh my God. <laughs> they literally wrote the lines on pieces of paper, like posters and no. shit, and put it all over the front of Justin Thoreau. So in the shot reverse shot, like we can't see Justin Thoreau because he has like lines of paper all over his, the his front of his face. body, <laughs> and the guy is reading the lines off of Justin Thoreau's body, and that's why it's so creepy because he, he delivers it so. Yes. With no affectation whatsoever. It's just because uh -huh. he's trying to focus on reading his lines. <laughs> okay. I fucking love that because <laughs> I find this performance very creepy and unnerving. The part where he says, if you do as I say, oh, you yeah. will see me one more time. If you do not, you will see me two more times. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite parts of this film because I find it so memorable. Well, it's, yeah, it is scary too, right? Because like, you, okay, yes. so you're going to see him for sure once. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see you once more, sir. Yeah, it's like, oh, am I going to see, am I going to see you again? I don't know. And also, when am I going to see you the second time? <laughs> mm -hmm. And in what capacity? No, thank you. No, yeah, thank exactly. You. I love it. Mm -hmm. So Adam is properly unnerved by this. So the next time that we see him is actually at this casting call that we have already talked about. And that is where he says, okay, Camilla Rhodes, aka Melissa George. Yes, she is the one that we will go with. Melissa George, man. I mean, like, again, I'm just thinking like with Adam looking like J.J. Abrams, like, well, I mean, Melissa George is going to be in uh, Alias in a couple of years and no one mm -hmm. will like her there. So <laughs> Another shared cinematic universe. Southland Tales. Alias, Alias Season 3. <laughs> <laughs> and all on Drive. Oh, boy. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the Adam section, and now we can head into the dark and sad story of one Diane Selwyn. <sighs> yeah. So, right. really, these two stories intersect, and we learn that Betty is actually Diane. She is a failed actress, and... I'm curious, Trace, do you read this as she had a relationship with Camilla, who yeah. is the Rita character? Or is it just that Camilla was helping her and she had an obsession with her? I choose to believe the former. I do, too. Okay. Because I think if you do the obsessive angle, that really does put a damper on the queer reading. I mean, like, correct. the queer reading is there, but it's not a positive queer reading. <laughs> yeah, and you could argue that there isn't a positive queer reading to this, because even if they are lovers, Camilla is a horrendous bitch. Also, you know, in this case, she is either pansexual or bisexual, but she comes off very badly because of her behavior. Well, that's the thing, right? So this is um, what, what some people call the tragic lesbian triangle in which an attractive yeah. but unavailable woman, Camilla, dumps a less attractive... I love less attractive, like Naomi oh my Watts. God. How dare you? <laughs> She's so hideous. <laughs> oh my God, Naomi Watts, get out of here with your ugly face. Dumps a less attractive woman who is, fi who is figured as exclusively lesbian, perpetuating mm -hmm. the stereotype, of course, that the bisexual ending up with a man, um, which... Oh no. Mm -hmm. Oh mm -hmm. dear. Mm -hmm. So you can look at it that way. You can, yeah. That, that is what it, what it is, basically. But again, we don't know enough about the real relationship between mm -hmm. Diane and Camilla to really say this is what it is, which is where the readings come in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're, we're still seeing glimpses, potentially, of their relationship through Diane's rapidly deteriorating mind as she is, you know, scramping around this house in her gross-ass looking bath robe thing mm -hmm. but it could just be that she is imagining these things like we don't know if these scenarios happened or if she's just fantasizing well there was a reading i saw too where they were like lynch presents lesbianism in its innocent and expansive form lesbian desire appears as one big adventure an entree into a glamorous and unknown territory which i huh. would say that about the first sex scene but yeah. i wouldn't say that at all about what happens in these final 20 25 minutes yeah, because there is a second kind of aborted sex scene between the two women where Diane is moping around and then she sees Camilla on the couch. She's topless again, so it, it definitely evokes that original sex scene. And then we see a kind of spunkier, healthier looking Diane, who is now also topless, jump on her. They start to make out and it seems like, oh, this is a flashback to better times yeah. and mm -hmm. we're getting insight into what the relationship was like. And this turns out to be the moment 
where Camilla says, uh, we're not doing this anymore because I can't. And so it's actually the breakup if we want to read it this way. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but this is what Diane is masturbating to. Yes. Which is why it's like, uh, is it real? Is it something that actually happened? Or is she just making up scenarios in her mind as she is absolutely furiously and painfully masturbating <laughs> so okay anecdote and quote to pull for you so anecdote from naomi wants herself and I i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this and listeners because i feel like when i tell this story people are going to be like what the fuck oh i i watched the interview okay. without realizing what it was and then was aghast Okay, so then you probably know this then. So listeners. Go ahead. Naomi Watts apparently had a bad stomach bug the day of this masturbation scene. And she, as she says in the interview, she was running to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> During the masturbation scene, it's filmed like cl extreme close-up of her face. And she's crying yes. and whatever. And she basically like yells to, to David Lynch. Like, David, I have to stop. I can't do this. And, mm -hmm. and David Lynch just goes, okay, Naomi, cool. And she doesn't, she's like, and I don't hear cut. And so I just keep doing it. I get so fucking pissed off at David Lynch that I then just start hitting, like, like, like doing the hitting masturbation moments. Yeah. And I'm like, and, but she's like, she's in pain. But, and so mm -hmm. she tells the story and it's like, oh my God, it's this funny thing that happened to me. But no, I was so uncomfortable. See, I thought, oh, this is fucking gross method direction and it's not okay. And see, I'm of, uh, I don't even want to say I'm of two minds. I mean, it, it also reminds you of Kubrick, right? Like not to that extent, but Kubrick, Hitchcock, Alvarez, uh, Tarantino. Yeah. Just male directors who put their female stars through the ringer to get the shot. But it's one of those things where I'm watching this and hearing it, I have an issue with it because I'm like, oh my God, like she wasn't, it's unless she wasn't even comfortable, but I mean, sorry, she wasn't comfortable, but not necessarily with the actual subject matter of masturbation. Mm -hmm. But she's so fine with it, like telling the story. So it's one of those things where I'm like, well, if she's fine with it, I'm fine with it. I don't know. But she's fine with it 15 years later. When she's telling the story, I feel like we're getting a glimpse into what the experience was like for her during shooting, and it sounds really bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. She does seem fine with it. I mean, David Lynch is sitting right next to oh, her, yeah. and she's crediting <laughs> him with making her career. But at the same time, I, I just keep thinking, what are we making these specifically actresses do for specifically male directors? And you think about, oh, well, this is the movie that made her career. Okay, well, she had to go through this to make it in Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. And that's why I wanted to bring it up, because I'm like, oh, like, I can just mm -hmm. imagine. I mean, this is what, 2014, 2015? I can just imagine this interview, like, making its way onto the websites today. Oh, yeah, it would and not be good. what would Twitter say about this interview, you know? <laughs> So anyway, so that's that. Listeners, I mean, again, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the morals and ethics of masturbatory direction. <laughs> <laughs> but Holiday in his article writes, Diane attempts to force Camilla to have sex, but is really just alone as she masturbates in misery. In her seminal essay, Jane Austen and the Masturbating Girl, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick explains the radical possibilities of masturbation. Because it escapes both the narrative of reproduction and, when practiced solo, it seems to have an affinity with amnesia, repetition, or the repetition compulsion. Mm. Diane's masturbatory experience appears to rupture the boundaries of her alleged fantasy. This queer temporality briefly returns her to an erotic time with Camilla, whether it be real or fictional. Yeah, yeah. And I love this idea that the queer reading of this film can involve the fact that we have queer characters, but also the queering of a linear temporal yes. line. Yes. And this film is the kind of sublimation of both of those ideas. Like, what are we seeing? We can't trust our eyes, but her queer desire is the thing that is kind of breaking down time and space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's fun stuff, man. Well, that's the thing, too. But I mean, because uh, okay, we use queer to describe ourselves, right? It's an umbrella. I'm sorry, we. Like, yes. A lot of people. Some people. I, I know some people don't. But <laughs> the literal definition of queer is like, you know, odd, strange, not normal. Whatever that means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this thing, like, you know, normal is basically the majority. What do yes. most things do? And normal narrative is linear. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Oh, the timeline is queer. Uh, which is mirroring the queer characters, which is mirroring the queer narrative. Like, mm -hmm. this movie is very queer, and you can read it positively or negatively. But unabashedly queer. So fascinating. So fascinating. And, I mean, I even saw a trans reading, because, again, the scenes we have with Adam aren't with Diane or Betty. Like, it's just him and on his own. So... Mm -hmm. 
even comparing it to like Possessor from earlier this year, it's basically like while it is Diane, I'm sorry, what well, could be Diane living out this revenge fantasy for Adam, it's also placing herself in the male body, this mm-hmm. trans gaze. And I'd never heard that reading about this movie no. before, and I find it very fascinating. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if somebody wants to unpack that. If we have any trans listeners, love to hear that one a mm-hmm. bit more. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's touch base with what else is happening in confirmed reality because everything that's happening in Diane's apartment is suspect, but we do know that she gets invited to a party Mm -hmm. by Camilla. So she agrees to go. She makes a mirror journey to the one that Rita made that opens the film where she gets in a limo. The limo stops unexpectedly. We don't stop here, but it has a slightly happier ending because Camilla is actually there to welcome her. I do my heart breaks at this part because Mm -hmm. it seems like there is a possibility that the two of them could make it work. Like Camilla has stopped her to lead her through this secret path that only the two of them will go on. And you think, Oh, cool. Okay, good. And then they get to the party at the top of the hill. There's Adam. He and Camilla are together. Coco is now his mom. And it's just so clear that Camilla has invited Diane to rub her fucking engagement in her ex's face. And the walk that she takes her on, is maybe I'm wrong, is it also the walk Diane takes in the beginning after the car crash? I don't know. It feels like they're going up, whereas Rita goes is going down. down. Oh, it's an inversion. Maybe that's intentional. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, this entire scene. I, we haven't really discussed much about how... I would argue the film is part satire of Hollywood culture. Maybe satire mm-hmm. is not the right word, but it's definitely a critique. Oh, yes. And we haven't talked about it much. I don't think there's, I mean, I think it's all pretty obvious what the film is trying to say about Hollywood. Shallow. shallow. Yeah. <laughs> Creepy, lecherous. I mean, yeah. you know, we'll say that the man auditioning Betty is Harvey Weinstein. Um, yeah, more or less. But the tale of Diane, it is a cliche tale, right? Like, like Ingenue goes to Hollywood, she doesn't make it, and then mm-hmm. bam, we have, we have Diane. Yeah. But it's still so sad because of Naomi Watts' performance. Yeah, and I think the fact that she and Laura Lena Herring have really good chemistry, and we spent two hours wanting them to get together and actually then seeing it happen, so then to see what the reality, again, Mm -hmm. air quotes, of the situation is, and Camilla is so cruel and so cold to her, and just taking this absolute delight in seeing what a failure diane is like basically the whole scene is diane observing her ex having this fet that is being thrown in her honor Mm -hmm. she's seeing her ex kissing her fiance she's seeing her ex kiss some random other woman because the original camilla rhodes also shows up in the scene we get another little bit with melissa george but okay but okay so who is melissa george here right because she's not camilla no fucking clue i think she's just another actress that diane has seen and like grabbed the image of yeah and just put her face on camilla because she needed to invent rita That, and I think also the fact that she might have feared that Camilla would leave her for another woman. In some cases, this is the worst case scenario because Camilla has left Diane for a man and a woman. Like, it's basically everyone but you. Well, so do you also view this, though, as Diane and Camilla were going for the same role and Camilla was chosen for it, and that was the beginning of the fracturing of their relationship? Quite possibly. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what to believe of anything in these final scenes, except for the fact that it was a bad breakup. Yeah, absolutely. And like, just the way Naomi Watts looks, it's not ugly, but like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but like, she just looks so dish, even at this party scene, when she's supposed to be kind of glammed up. It's just like, there's an air about her, right? Absolutely. Yeah. She has a defeated Mm -hmm. look to her, even though she is still like, I mean, she's Naomi Watts. She looks fucking great. Yeah. (laughs) But everybody else looks Hollywood glamour, red carpet premiere look. Yeah. And she is just kind of sad and mopey and crying. And I love the fact that she's basically telling her entire story to Coco, who is giving off this, oh, you poor, sad yeah. mom vibes kind of deal, right? It's mm-hmm. just, it's all so depressing. So, of course, when she goes home, this is where she decides, okay, I'm going to take what money I have left. I'm going to pay a hitman who is the same hitman that we saw in the first Mm -hmm. part of the film. She gives him the glossy. So the headshot of Camilla, this is the girl. 
And then she gives him the money and he gives her the key. When you see the key, that means that it will be done. done. That's what the blue key means. Which we've seen from the very beginning of this coda. Like Mm -hmm. once we enter the coda at the two hour mark, like we already see like she stares at the key on the coffee table. Yeah. Yeah. So really, even this last, I call it an act, but it's really nonlinear. Like the rest of the film is playing with questionable amounts of time, like particularly if you want to compare the Rita and Betty versus Adam storyline. It's like Adam storyline seems to take place in less than a day, whereas the Rita Betty stuff takes place over multiple days. Yeah, yeah. But this last act, we have no idea when anything is happening. It's really fractured because you're right. The moment we're introduced to Diane, the key is already on the table. So I, I again, I'm thinking about this now because I've actually never thought about it being nonlinear. But you're right, it is. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. for me, it's very much like, okay, she wakes up, she sees the key, her mind has fractured at that point. Like she's already mm-hmm. suffered from depression. She's been angry. But yeah. when she sees the key, she knows what she's done. Yes her mind fractures so she has all these you know surreal memories happening that seem real but they're not Mm -hmm. and so what actually happens for me is yeah she sees the key she has all these flashes of memories and i don't know how long she's sitting there thinking about these things right after the lesbian neighbor comes and gets her shit Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then she her memories and stuff are enough to push her over the edge she goes Mm -hmm. insane starts seeing Irene and what's his name from earlier as little tiny people like not little people but like little people yeah and they chase her through her apartment yes the first time I saw this scary man it is very scary and again the quick cut because when she blows her I'm a sucker for that I didn't love this movie but the lodge when I'm spoiler alert in the first five minutes Alicia Silverstone kills herself Mm -hmm. like it's a fast cut where it's like you you see the blood spot or you hear the gun go off but it immediately cuts to something else yeah it's so effective because it's so yeah. quick. Yeah. And really, that's more or less where the movie ends. So Diane dies by suicide. And then we see the room fill with the same blue smoke that we mm-hmm. saw at Club Silencio. And then over top of the fading image, we see flashbacks, memories, hallucinations of these happier times when the girls were at Club Silencio. But it looks like they're being lit up by spotlights. And it's the same kind of visual look as what Betty and Irene looked like when they first arrived in Hollywood. It's like happier times, brighter, sunnier pieces. And yeah, then we see the woman from Club Silencio with the blue hair signal okay that was the end of the show the performance is now done she says silencio but it might as well be fiend yeah more or less See, i i found a reading i mean this is actually the wikipedia so here we go okay. <laughs> Ooh, bringing in the big hitter the scholars of wikipedia no it's just, so the images following diane's apparent suicide undermine the dream and reality interpretation mm-hmm. it might be that the last sequence comprises the fantasy images of diane's dying consciousness concluding oh oh, oh that's what i said oh <laughs> You're as smart as Wikipedia. Maybe it was a subconscious movie. That's where I got that from. Uh, oh concluding God. with the real moment of her death, the final silencio. The 90 second coda that follows Betty slash Diane's suicide is a cinematic space that persists after the curtain has dropped on her living mm. consciousness. And the persistent space is the very theater where the illusion of illusion is continually unmasked. Like, yeah. That is some, like, real surreal... I mean, surreal, obviously, it's surreal. We're saying surreal constantly. But it's, like, (laughs) it's hard to visualize what this is. But it's, like, when we're talking about how the movie goes meta in some places, if we want to go by this reading, that is the most meta of meta things. (laughs) Oh, sure. It really reminds me of the way that we talk about directors from the French New Wave, like, particularly um, Jean-Luc Godard, where he was constantly making audiences aware that they were watching a movie. (laughs) And I feel like this is the subtler, gentler American version by David Lynch where he's saying, hey, do you get that I just made you watch a movie about a person who is more or less making and playing out a movie? Mm -hmm. Hey, do you get it? The curtain has dropped. Silencio. Get it? (laughs) The more optimistic, I mean, going even back to the dream theory, the optimistic version is, oh, this last 20, 25 minutes is Betty's nightmare, which you could read it that way. The problem with that is, at least for me, is that then you don't have an ending to the reality. Mm -hmm. But then there's a theory that's like, oh, the film is a Mobius strip. There is no beginning. There is no end. It just is. So then we're just going to loop back around. Or you can watch the fantasy as a purgatory. And every time she opens the blue box, she's brought back to quote unquote reality. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's so many different ways. And because we're on horror queers, (laughs) I'm just like, okay, well, maybe it's just like, again, it's all lesbian guilt. I don't know. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, this movie is very clearly steeped in guilt and temptation and wanting things that you can't have, whether that is a dream of becoming a Hollywood Mm -hmm. star or just simply being with the girl that you want to be with. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. I just, I love how many different readings it has, but how complimentary they are. And we haven't really talked about it, but this movie is also really fucking gorgeous because it is shot on film and David Lynch has a great eye. And there's so many iconic shots and the way that everything plays out. It's really just a captivating film to watch. And to think that this was going, because it's shot for TV. Yeah. Like, this isn't shot for movies, <laughs> for, for a theater. I mean, I'm assuming he uses the, the camera for theater, because it's the, the aspect ratio, but whatever. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just so fun to me. Like, I want to talk about this movie with people. I love hearing people's theories. I mean, we've given a lot of different people on the internet's readings and theories, but, like, again, listeners, let us know what you make of this. I'm interested to know if y'all hated it. <laughs> yeah, for first time viewers, very curious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think watching it alone would be more frustrating. I think it'd be more fun to watch it with at least one other person because this is something that you are going to want to talk about this movie with mm-hmm. someone afterwards. And if not, if you're left to your own devices, I feel like you might get more frustrated with it, if anything. Uh, that's when I just appreciate being able to turn to the internet. Yeah. Like, I think about <laughs> what if this film had to come out in the 70s or the 80s before we had the internet, and you just had to watch it and then try to, to talk about this experience to somebody. <laughs> yeah, because I remember I saw it and then immediately started searching to just get a sense of whether I was on track. Because mm-hmm. I was I was a, a young dum-dum, and I was like, I need to know what the mystery is. I didn't get it. <laughs> and I stumbled on a Salon article I think at the end of the year, it was their top viewed article on the whole site. And it was basically, this is what the fucking movie is about. Like, I'm going to do it and set it out in an attempt to do it chronologically. It was bananas. (laughs) It was very long. Oh, yeah, that's a fool's errand. (laughs) I mean, as I said off the top, I really, really, really like this movie. But Mm -hmm. I feel like you're kind of doing it wrong if you're trying to solve every little thing. For me, the enjoyment of the film is watching the film just letting yourself go let yourself be swept away with it and sure actively watch it because there's great things to be gained from making the kinds of connections we've talked about but overall lose yourself in it yes yep yep i had something eloquent to say but you you've you've really hit the nail on the head there (laughs) but i wouldn't shut the fuck up and you lost it i know it's good i'm good no you're 100 percent right i mean i don't want to know the answer to this movie because it's just Mm -hmm. It exists in a space outside of itself, even. Like, this film will live forever because it's so metatextual. Yeah. It constantly refers to itself as a movie. And it invites discourse. discourse. It invites conversation. Mm -hmm. And I don't... Unless you hate it, obviously, which I can see people not liking this movie. But, like, I feel like the arguments... Sorry, the discussions you would have about, oh, it's this reading, it's this reading, it's this reading. You're not going to be arguing about it. It's always going to be like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's cool. Mm. Because you can't tell someone, oh, that's not right. That's wrong. Because it's not possible. It's not that kind of movie. There isn't one definitive right reading for this film. Yeah, I always think about (laughs) that South Park episode, um, The Tale of Scrody McBooger Balls. Oh my god, Trace. Okay, no, no, but sorry, Butters writes this really, sorry, the kids write this really obnoxious book where they mention Sarah Jessica Parker like 457 times and whatever, but like, it takes off as like brilliant literature and people are arguing about how it's how it's actually left-wing or it's actually right-wing and it's like, uh, oh. Okay. So it just reminds me of that. <laughs> wow. So- <laughs> and now David Lynch is coming to your house to shoot you. Mulholland Drive and Scrody my Booger Balls, same thing. I hate everything. <laughs> We've made it so close to the end sounding smart. <laughs> Um, that is a very smart episode of South Park. But it is. It's very funny. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Is there anything else you want to touch on, Joe? No. Honestly, what more could be said? Everything and nothing. I, well, that's the thing, right? Like, you could easily make an eight-hour podcast episode out of this movie. There are so many things we didn't touch on because mm-hmm. there are so many things in this movie. So this is where we will pass it off to you listeners. Start a discourse or continue a discourse that you've had about this movie for the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. Talk about it. I just, I'm, I, I, I'm so curious to hear y'all's thoughts about this. Yes, I am open to fan fiction about what Penny from Showgirls would have done if this had a gone to series. Oh my god, can you imagine? I can't, but I want to. Okay, um, well yeah, so that has been Mulholland Drive. 
And before we announce what we're covering next week, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers. And join <laughs> God, that <laughs> affectation. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter. Uh, and join our Facebook Horror Queers group to hang out with other listeners. You can also find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel you can check out. And uh, if you have a moment. So Joe and I are busy uh, with festivals all month, but please go... That's not relevant, but please go leave a review <laughs> on Apple Podcasts while we're busy doing things. So when we come back, we can come back to all these hopefully five star reviews. Oh, so sweet. Thank you in advance. <laughs> Yay. And if you want even more horror queers content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horror queers. We are in September, so go subscribe to hear our recommendations on weird horror films, plus episodes on Nia DaCosta's new Candyman film, James Wan's new film Malignant, Netflix's new series brand new cherry flavor and an audio commentary on really good vampire movie 30 days of night all right so that's our fun patreon for the month uh joe yes what are we covering next week oh boy we're sticking with some lesbian drama trace but we are going way back into the past because ah! we're gonna talk about dracula's daughter oh i have never heard of this movie <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is quintessential lesbian drama. Yay. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to say, based on the title, everyone, for homework, go listen to our episode on the vampire lovers. Yeah, not bad. Or dra our, uh, Daughters of Darkness. Or, or both. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, until next week, everyone, I think we can cross out Mulholland Drive. Yes, and cross out Horror Queers. <laughs> Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares, like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.